If you would turn in your Bibles to uh, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, it's in your pew Bibles on page 986, so we just continue to make our way through. Um, Thessalonica was a port city in the northern part of Greece, one of the first churches Paul founded. This is one of his earliest letters, and we're just making our way through again. Uh, if you came in a little late, we have potluck afterwards, plenty of food. Uh, the Rolo Home Group's going to help clean up. And also, if you don't know CCF, you have been volunteered to help clean up as well. And uh, we appreciate that. And let, any college students, we'd love your help. We don't want to discriminate. If you all want to help clean up, it's always appreciated. And there'll be people that can uh, tell you what to do. So uh, let's hear now, though, God's word. First Thessalonians 2. This is our second week. We're going to look at the first eight verses, second week in this passage. Last week, we considered the theme of imitation as the gospel spreads. Today, we're going to consider uh, the kind of people that we should look to imitate. So let's read God's word. Chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. For you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Our God, may the, the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. God, give us leaders. A time like this demands great leaders. Leaders whom the lust of office does not kill. Leaders whom the spoils of life cannot buy. Leaders who possess opinions and a will. Leaders who have honor. Leaders who will not lie. Leaders who can stand before a demagogue and damn his treacherous flatteries without winking. Tall leaders, sun-crowned, who live above the fog in public duty and private thinking. That was a prayer given in the middle of the Civil Rights Movement by Martin Luther King, Jr., based on a poem written in 1872 by a man you've probably never heard of, a novelist named Josiah Gilbert Holland. And I wish that I could say this prayer with the same eloquence as Martin Luther King spoke, but I hope you could hear his voice and the courage with which he would pray such a prayer. And, and he knew that God needed to raise up leaders for such a time as he lived in. Leaders who are willing to stand for what is right in the face of police batons and ferocious dogs and power hoses and in time an assassin's bullet. I've been trying to read a little bit more out of my own tradition of Reformed Presbyterianism, which is mostly a bunch of dead white men, 
And one of those is Martin Luther King. And that's true, I don't agree with all of his theology and not all of his politics. But surely he was a man who understood what courageous Christian leadership was. I've been reading through the Psalms to look for promises from God and for comfort for my soul. And it struck me how often David in particular brings up all of the enemies he faced. As early as Psalm 3, which uh, we read earlier, he begins by saying, Oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising up against me. Arise, O oh Lord, save me, O oh my God. Facing conflict and facing enemies is a sure part of the Christian life. And we need examples to follow that will help us learn how to face such conflict. Even our children, as Billy asked prayer for, as they face bullying in school, how are they, as Christians, and yes, we believe our children are Christians as they trust Christ, how are they to face up to it? When you think of what makes a strong leader, what, what do you think of? Do you think of people with great charisma and speaking skills? Do you think of someone who has been outwardly successful and therefore can give those TED Talks and seminars? Uh, do you think of someone who is able to, to work the room and bring people together? All of these are worthwhile traits in a leader, and they're almost a matter of natural gifts found in both believers and unbelievers. And, God can certainly use all of that. But on top of these type of gifts, the Apostle Paul describes a kind of leadership which is deeper, one which is based on courage and character, leadership which finds its value in Jesus Christ more than on being popular or successful. And this means that this is a kind of leadership which is not always up front. Christ dwells in all of his people, and so that is the kind of leadership. Where you see Christ dwelling, where you see the character of Christ, that's the kind of leadership you should look for. That's the kind of the traits that you should imitate, even if it is someone in the back, even if it is someone who's quiet. One of my favorite chapters in... Uh, the Old Testament about David's life was when he was wrong. He had already been anointed king, and, and in 1 Samuel 25, he sets out on a bloodlust course to, to kill a man and his family who had opposed him. And God raised up a woman, Abigail the wise, and then she then bore the character of Christ and rebuked David. And then he showed his quality by being corrected by her and listening and repenting. Good, godly leadership is not a matter of gifts. It's not a matter of those who are up front. It's a matter of those who reflect Christ. And that's really what we saw last week as we began to look at this text, that the gospel spreads not so much by media campaigns, but by the imitation of seeing Christ in others. That it's something that is done throughout the body of Christ, person to person. And we saw that it, it spreads in a kind of paradoxical way that the gospel comes with both affliction and conflict, but also with great joy. Well, why? Because Paul came and told them that here are the words of eternal life. God himself has come to bear your sins, to be the way of salvation, and yes, to follow him means to pick up your cross and to, to share in his sufferings, but, but, but the, the result is that you get eternal life. It's all by grace. You're a forgiven sinner. And, and so you have a choice. You can live a life of comfort that lasts 80 or 90 years, and then you go to hell. That's the easy way. Or you can turn from your sins and come to God for his love and grace. And through all the difficulties of this life, know that in the end you're going to heaven and that it's worth it. And so it comes with affliction and it comes with joy. And then it spreads in ways that are both loud. Some people are called to proclaim it. As Paul says, the gospel echoed forth from you. 
but it also spread in ways that were quiet as people heard the example of the Thessalonians. Just average people, merchants and slaves and, and housekeepers following the gospel. And so the gospel spread as people saw their example quietly. And then finally we saw that the gospel leads believers to turn away from the idols of this world and then to wait for the coming of their Savior when he will make all things new. That the picture of the Christian life is not a one-time event, but as Martin Luther, the first Martin Luther, famously wrote in his first thesis, that repentance is a lifelong endeavor of the Christian. But knowing that in the end, our hope is certain. And so if, if that is the way the gospel spreads, right, through imitation and seeing Christ in others, it's pretty important that we find the right people to imitate. And not just those that are full of fluff and, and vigor and false promises, but those who really follow Christ. And so that's the kind of leader that Paul then describes using himself and these other uh, 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 servants with him as examples. So what we're, it begins in verse, we're going to look, begin in verse 2, uh, where he says, we had already suffered in, in Philippi, but then as we, we came, we had boldness, despite the suffering, we had boldness to declare to you this good news of God coming to save the world. And then verse 3, for our appeal to you does not spring from error or impurity or attempts, and then he, he, and he goes on to describe. And so actually, as we look at these, these traits, there's actually six negative traits of leadership that Paul tried to avoid, and then we'll look at the positive ones. But we're going to go through these six uh, pretty importantly. These are the things you don't want to imitate in others, but are very common. Now, as we look at these, keep in mind this is a spectrum. It's, it's easy to just label people as all good or all bad, but it's a spectrum. These are all things that we can fall into one way or another, and the key is when you see them in, in a leader, to, uh, even though they may be a forgiven sinner, no one's perfect, to not imitate those things. So let's look at, at what Paul's leadership was not based on. First of all, we start in verse 3. There's three things in verse 3. First of all, it did not come from error. So we always start there, right? Uh, Paul could have been the nicest guy in the world, but if he handled the Old Testament wrongly or, or preached a defective Christ, then he's disqualified out of the box. True godliness is always founded on truth itself, revealed truth by God, not, not the imaginations of our own heart, not the things we want to believe, but as God himself tells us. And it takes humility to, to submit ourselves to truth. As Jesus said, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. So if a leader or a church does not stand by that, no matter how loving they may appear or how, how kind or all the good things they do, they are not worth imitating. If they say truth is just found by every individual on their own, then they are leading with error. So you want leaders who will teach you the truth from God's word, always pointing to Jesus Christ. It's all about Christ. Not being distracted by secondary issues, uh, to lead you down false rabbit trails that cause dissension and trouble, but those that will stand on truth. That's where we begin. Secondly, Paul's appeal did not come from impurity. Now, this is a, a broad term, but because he brings up other things later, I do think this is referring specifically to sexual immorality, uh, which some leaders pursue. You might remember last week we talked about the three great idols, as sex, money, and power, or as uh, uh, John puts it in his letter, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, that's coveting, wanting more stuff, and the boastful pride of life. And preachers are not immune to these temptations, and they sometimes use their leadership as an opportunity to feed their appetites. And sadly, impurity or sexual immorality is one way that they can abuse their power. It's all over the news these days of various Christian leaders that had it all together up front, that spoke truth, and yet on the side were abusing women one after another and using their position to do so. Some cults 
are just upfront about this, and their leaders promote their own polygamy. Other times, it's been more regulated in the history of the church. Uh, there's a part of the medieval church that said, yes, we know our priests and bishops will have mistresses, but they had to be kept 12 miles away from their, their cathedral so it's not to cause scandal. You know, keep it on the side. But sadly, this is not just a matter of church history. It's in our own ranks. Stories of predators. The PCA, our denomination, just put out a report to help us spot and discipline such abuses. But Paul didn't come with such a motive in mind. He wasn't using his power to gain access to vulnerable women, no. Paul was single. He was single-minded. He was celibate. He learned to die to himself. His appeal was sincere. The third thing to watch out for, Paul says he did not attempt to deceive. Uh, what you saw is what you got with Paul. and, and In fact, that's, that's one reason he mentions afflictions so much. He was coming to bring the Thessalonians the best news possible, the, the words of eternal life that would bring them joy, and yet he didn't lie to them. He didn't say this gospel is going to solve all of your problems now. He didn't come promising them health and wealth, but actually the very opposite, as they faced uh, opposition for, for, for calling Christ Lord instead of Caesar. The gospel often brings affliction and trouble. In fact, I mean, if you are, let me just be blunt, if you are a faithful Christian, then you are, in one sense, automatically poorer because you're giving away your goods to the poor. Uh, you're, you're bringing a tithe of your income to help the spread of the kingdom through the local church or other ministries. Right? You are automatically a little bit less well off. And yet it's a joy, it's a glory to do so because then we are imitating Christ and being a servant. And so Paul then came as a man of integrity. He didn't maneuver politically around them, telling one group one thing to, and then telling another group another. He didn't treat them transactionally so that they're always having to guess what his real motives were. You all have met people like that. I, and I've had peers uh, that are well known and they've treated me well and they've given me compliments and, and I was thinking, oh, well, that's encouraging. And then I realized a little bit later they're trying to get something from me. They're trying to get my support. And maybe some of their motives were sincere, but look for these sorts of, of insincere motives where someone, even a Christian leader, scratches their back just so you will scratch theirs instead of it being a mutual affection coming from the Holy Spirit and out of free will. That's why, I just, I don't know, as an example, I try to always be up front when I want to meet with somebody. And let's say my motive is because I need you to lead a, I want you to lead a, a prayer meeting or a home group. I don't want to pretend and say, hey, I just want to check in and see how you are. And then, you know, lower the boom later. No bait and switch. I, I mean, sometimes I've done that by accident uh, because I've forgotten. But, but I, I want to say, this is what I want to meet about. So you know, whatever Paul's faults were, he was sincere as dirt. Fourth, Paul says he did not come with words of flattery. Uh, and and this, is, this is a little different than deception, but it's slightly different. A flattering leader is someone, they don't lie to folks, but they only tell them what they want to hear in order to build up their own following. So they, they, they might tell you stuff that's true about you. Oh, you're a wonderful singer. Uh, you always dress so well. But it's always words of flattery to manipulate. Uh, I had a, a friend in college named Mark, and a really just nice, nice guy. My favorite story about Mark is when he was working in um, a supermarket for his summer job, and he heard a loud noise. And so he ran into the middle of the store, and he yelled, run for your lives, we're all going to die. And so they cleared out the store, and then they just found out the freezer was turning on. But that, this has nothing to do with, with this text, it's just it's funny. But the, the thing I remember about Mark is he could never say anything bad about anyone. It was always positive. Like we were at a college with a big basketball program and always, you know, demonizing the other team. And he'd always compliment the other team and that kind of thing. And so I, I, I thought I'd try to put him on a test to see if he could ever say anything critical about anyone. So I ran through all these historical figures that were 
criminals, and he, he just always had compliments for them. I said, okay, finally, Mark, what about Hitler? And he thought about it and scratched his head and said, well, I'm sure he had his good points, and then walked away. <laughs> Couldn't even say something bad about Hitler. So here's the point. You want a leader, you want Christians in your life that when they compliment you, you know they mean it. Because also you know they love you enough that if needed, they would be willing to rebuke you or to sharpen you. As the book of Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Fifthly, Paul says he did not come with a pretext for greed. Now this one is, was obvious that many Christian leaders are after one thing, your money. And it, it can be very blatant with, with blatant appeals or, uh, on television or whatever, always doing fundraising. I mean, I love my, the favorite ones at the end of December. It's never been more important to give than now. There's never been greater kingdom needs more than now. I was like, what, that same as last year? I mean, does it never change? Or charging, even in the history of the church, charging money for prayers or conducting the sacraments. Church is constantly stressing money and the budget. And you may have noticed we try to do the very opposite here. We have a weekly offering, and we pray for it, and that's about it. And now and again, when I get my act together, I put a, a financial report in the bulletin, but I usually just forget. Or there's not room in the bulletin. I'd rather put in something about potluck or something like that. It's, and this is a little bit purposeful because God has always provided. We're not after your money here. God is after your hearts but there are other more subtle ways that leaders can, can, can do their ministry out of greed, right? Staying in the fanciest hotels or fancy meals or other perks. Or sometimes, really, treating visitors differently based on their supposed income level, right? Uh, uh, so, like, if, if, if somebody comes in and I can immediately tell they're a, they are a business tycoon because they're wearing a top hat and a spectacle, then... <laughs> I can treat them extra special. Do we really want them to be part of this church? And they could fund the new, extent, uh, the new parking lot or whatever it is. James says making such distinctions is evil. Finally, Paul gives a sixth negative feature to avoid, and that's in verse 6. As we look at this together, he says, Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. And then this gets at the heart of the matter of, of a leadership you don't want to imitate. Ungodly uh, 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 Christians or leaders that seek glory from men rather than God. It's the opposite where Paul says, that we, we, we are trying to please God who tests our hearts. These are, these are people that, like Jesus describes in Matthew 23, where they, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. That, that they love this. It's, it's not just that they wanted a chair up front because it's closer to the pulpit, but they, they, want a big, they want to be noticed that they're up front. They want to be first in the potluck line because they're the leader. Now, somebody has to be first. So please, if you're a visitor or, or family with young children, someone's got to. So you be first. But that's just a matter of logistics. It's not a matter of, saying, of trying to look for honor. And so false leaders want to be recognized here and now for how great they are rather than waiting for their heavenly reward. I mean, if you think about it, if anybody could have asked for human glory, as Paul kind of hints at, it would have been Peter and Paul and the other apostles. These were men, uh, that, and, 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 and some of their servants, and, and women were there too in that mix, that saw the risen Christ. And they were commissioned by him to establish the church. And so maybe Paul could walk in here, or Mary, one of the first ones to see Christ, and, and, and they say, Where, where's my carving up on the wall with the other 12 apostles and other women that were there? Where's the boss relief? Is that what I say? Where, where, where is, where am I? 
And you know, have they gotten me right? How do I look? Is that my good side they've gotten? But Paul wouldn't have done that. He would have come and he would sit in the back and then he would teach us if we invited him to, but not before. See, Paul didn't have time for any of that ceremonial nonsense. He had souls to save and churches to plant. It's all about Christ, not about any glory that he thinks he deserves. And this is true not just in the church, but really in, in, in your occupations, whatever you are doing. Why are you doing it? Are you doing it to be recognized by others? Are you doing it for, for more certificates and awards to put up on the I love me wall, as we used to call them in the army? I like the way Barney Fife put it. Uh, when he was, when Mayberry tried to give him some award or a pie or something, I don't know. He said, you know how I feel about all this fuss and fodder all. Lord knows the job itself is reward enough. I was reminded of that quote by my friend Ron Parrish, who was taken by COVID a couple of years ago. And they, he put this, his family put this quote in his obituary because that's how he lived. He didn't care about receiving human glory. The job itself was reward enough, and Ron has already received his heavenly reward. So those are the six traits, negative traits, to look out for in some leaders and in ourselves. Those who are false, those who are impure, deceitful, flattering, greedy, or vainglorious. And so even if you see some of those and otherwise good men and women, don't imitate those traits, right? Instead, imitate where you do see Christ in them. And so here, I think it's just good to pause briefly before we, we move on to the positive traits to look, to do some introspection. You see, it's, it's way too easy to see these faults in others and then fail to see them in ourselves, at least to some degree. Um, a, a very good Christian counselor named Ed Welch wrote a book a number of years ago that maybe, maybe some of you have read. It's, it's on my shelf, and I still haven't read it, but people have said good things about it. The, the title itself tells you what it's about. When people are big and God is small. And so for me, in my life, I try to tell the truth, but I can be tempted to shade it or avoid certain sins or subjects. I don't want to offend you. I don't want to bring up things that are controversial, so I might just, you know, never preach on them, never talk about them. I may be tempted to flatter you. I try not to be greedy, but I can compare myself to others, and that can show up in subtle ways. Or I can want recognition, not statues or anything like that, but I want praise, and so I can fish for that. And I do all this when I forget how much God loves me. And the praise of man becomes big, when really the praise of God is all I need, that he's already put all of his love and affection on me in Christ Jesus, and that should be enough. And so these worldly concerns can kind of come in and, 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 and crowd out Christ or cloud him so that you don't see him as well. And this passage is not about me, but look, when I'm in the pulpit, I'd rather talk about my weaknesses than yours. If you want to hear about yours, let's have a cup of coffee, and I'd be happy to tell you. Now no one's going to take me up for that. And the point is this, it's not that Pastor Rolo or myself or any of the other leaders say that we have none of these traits but it's that when we see them with Paul, we say we are the worst of sinners. But for that very reason, mercy was shown to us that we can be examples of those who, who struggle with some of these things. And yet want to set an example of someone who's trying to put our faith in God and his love so that we can be men and women of integrity. That's what it's all about. So we don't want to end with these negatives. We want to end with Christ. So let's Let's look at positive ways. And there's just two. Don't worry. We're, we're going to make it to potluck. Just two things to end with that are the positive traits of Christ-centered leadership. Look at verse 4. Paul says, We have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak not to please man, 
but to please God who tests our hearts. This is the main thing. This is the main theme of this passage, that Paul was someone who did everything in God's sight to please God rather than man. That's it. This is courage. This is godly leadership. And then you can see why it's leadership not just from pastors and those up front who speak loudly, but from every single person who lives quietly to please God rather than man. I see it in so many of you. And that's not flattery. I really do. Those of you who put Christ first, who make courageous decisions, who end up in conflict but are trying to do the right thing. And it's because Paul was, was God-centered that enabled him to be so courageous. That is how he could be a tall leader, sun-crowned, who lived above the fog. Because his eyes were, were focused heavenly. He's lived above the fog of all the, the worldly gunk because his eyes were focused heavenly. And he knew where his hope was coming from. One day when Christ would come again and say, well done, good and faithful servant. And so if people accepted his message, he was blessed. They joined him in that heavenly sense. But if people rejected his message, he also was blessed. And like Joseph, as Pastor Rollo said, says that even when I'm rejected, I know that God will work these things for good. What they meant for evil, God will work for good. It's faith in God's love, not faith in being popular or acceptable or growing or acceptable or, or successful. That is what allowed Paul to be so bold. These are the kinds of examples I look for in Christian history. Men and women who are willing to stand by their convictions even when it costs them their livelihood or worse. And if you need a place to start, if you don't know who these are, go to our website and look under sermons and look down to the YouTube videos of the figures in Christian history that, that Taylor put together during uh, uh, the, the shutdown. Wonderful videos about men like, and, and, and women like Polycarp and Lottie Moon and Phyllis Wheatley and Wang Ziming, if I'm saying his word correctly, a, a martyr during the communist purge in China. Or you can go to our webpage again and look at the beliefs and there's a, a, a group of, of, of carvings up there at the top and that's not the apostles. It's actually 20th century martyrs taken from Westminster Abbey in London. And you can Google that. You can go to Westminster Abbey and look at who these 20th century martyrs were, including Martin Luther King. In our day, it's, it's men like Chinese pastor Wang Yi, who was pastor of the Early Reign Covenant Church in Chengdu and uh, the Pulowskis, who have been worshiping with us, uh, used to attend there, and they know him. Pastor Yi just was trying to live a quiet life and respecting the government, minding his own business. But when they told him to shut down his church, he said, I have to obey God rather than man. And so now he's in prison. A man like that understands this verse far better than, than I ever will. But here's the thing. We don't have to be physical martyrs like these men and women. We simply have to be men, women, and children of integrity in our own settings. After all, later on in the letter, Paul writes in chapter 4, verse 11, if you want to know where he's going, he says uh, that make it your ambition, so this is your goal, to live quietly to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands. But doing all of that to please God rather than men. When you do that, you too will be bold for Christ. But there, there, there's one last thing. In case you think oh, this is all Paul is saying, that in affliction he came boldly, he wasn't scared. I think he probably was scared at times if you read 2 Corinthians but he still stood by, his, uh, by, by the message of the gospel, no matter what uh, trouble it caused him. Is that all? That, that we just must be bold for Jesus and then run people over? No, look, look down to verses 7 and 8. It's, this is the, the demonstration of that boldness. This is what it looked like in Paul's life. But we were gentle among you like a nursing mother. 
taking care of her children. And we were ready to share with you our own selves because you are dear to us. We'll consider this more later. But just think about this, this bold image that Paul is putting forth here. It's not exactly what we call a manly John Wayne image, is it? He was bold, but what did it look like? It looked like a nursing mother being gentle and then sharing his lives with them. He, he wasn't some distant lecturer towering above them, but he came down, he lived with them. That is what it looked like to be bold for Christ. For Paul, fearing God rather than man made him more gentle, more kind, more empathetic, not less. Let me say that again. For Paul, fearing God rather than man made him more gentle and more kind. You see, it's in our culture, and in most cultures, it's often those who are most brash, most cocksure, most bold in an outward way who most fear man, right? They worry about what you think about them, so they have to put on a bravado as if they have it all together. When behind it all, they're a mess. But they don't want you to see that, so they put on this image of being a strong leader. And in our, in our reformed culture, it's usually men, honestly, making a mess of things because they don't understand true boldness. You see, the gospel allows us to do the very opposite. We know we are a mess, but God loves us anyway. So we don't have to pretend to be less sinful than we are, or smarter than we are. Like, I didn't tell you I read this book. I mean, I could pretend like I had, but I mean, you, you could see that it hasn't even been bent, so I, I, you could tell I was lying. We don't have to pretend to be smarter than we are. We don't have to pretend to be better leaders than we are. I'm really bad at some things. But you see, that allows us to treat people as Paul did, like nursing mothers. Maybe that's what it means to be a God-fearing leader. God give us leaders. A time like this demands great leaders. Leaders whom the lust of office does not kill, leaders whom the spoils of life cannot buy, leaders who have honor, leaders who will not lie, tall leaders, sun-crowned, who live above the fog. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ is our King and that he came as a servant and that we all can imitate him and lead one another as we are gentle with one another, as we are bold to stand on the truth of God, as we are faithful and sometimes bring wounds because we love one another. But we pray, Lord Jesus, give us courage in the face of an unbelieving world, in the face of bullies, in the face of liars, Help us to be men and women and children of integrity, those who fear you, because in Christ we know we have nothing to fear. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we stand together and close with the hymn, um, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Please stand together.